Hey, it's me, Rebecca Greenfield, the host of The Paycheck. This spring, we took a hard look at the pay gap, its history, why it still exists, and what's being done to fix it. If there was one thing we wanted to achieve with our series, it was to get people, especially women, talking. And it worked. After the show ended, the conversation didn't. We heard from listeners who told us their own stories of pay discrimination and sexism. And here at Bloomberg, we kept reporting on and talking about the pay gap and all the other issues we discussed on the show. But we wanted to do more. We wanted to hear for ourselves the conversations we know women are having with each other behind closed doors. So we went out and found some of the smartest women we could think of who work in law, finance, medicine, and even competitive poker. And then we asked them to talk to each other and let us listen in. And it was great. They talked about the particular challenges of starting a business as a woman, why motherhood should be a job qualification, and how after decades of working, you can still feel unqualified for a job. For the next few weeks, we're going to be bringing those conversations to you. Think of it like a masterclass. First up, we tackle the world of finance. And if there's anybody who knows what it's like as a woman in the highest levels of banking and wealth management, it's Sally Krawcheck. She's the former chief financial officer of Citigroup, and she was fired in 2011 under what she says were gendered circumstances. With her is Bianca Caban, who is fresh out of Columbia Business School, and she's trying to change the power dynamics of finance from the inside. My name is Bianca Caban. I lead partnerships at Republic. We are an investment platform that allows startups and blockchain projects to raise capital from retail investors. I'm here to interview Sally Krawcheck. We actually did a case study about you. Oh my gosh. Business school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah. When, when I- Really? Yes, when I heard, oh, you know, you have the opportunity to meet Sally Krawcheck, I thought, oh my goodness, she's my girl, career, idol, crush. I'm Sally Krawcheck. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Alavest, which is an investing platform for women. Uh, and I'm here today with Bianca Caban from Republic. I want to kick it off at the very beginning, Sally, and talk about your early life. And so when you were growing up and you thought about what you wanted to be... A princess. <laughs> did you ever think that you would be a global chief executive. Yeah, totally. That, <laughs> when I was growing up, I was like princess or global chief executive. It was going to be one of those two. Hell no. You know, I just, it was one step at a time. But um, my lessons, you know, that I learned were I wasn't smarter than anybody else that I could see. I could work harder than everybody else. And I could be a considered risk taker. You know, in every step of the way, I noticed that the big important calls in one's career could be the contrarian ones. And if I could do enough work to get comfortable that nothing is certain, but that the risk I was going to take or I was going to have our team take had a better than even chance of working out, I wasn't nervous to take on risk. But I really would much rather have taken the risks that could potentially get me fired than to be in the middle of a pack. If you get fired, pick yourself up, you wipe yourself off. What, what's the worst thing that happened? I just got fired. So yeah. what? You know, go on and find something else. But what about you? When you think about your whole career is really in front of you, you're just out of business school. You've just started with an interesting, um, exciting, innovative startup. What do you see for yourself? I certainly didn't plan anything. If you had asked me, you know, when I was growing up in New York City that I would ever be exposed to Wall Street, I would say to you, I don't even know what Wall Street is. Oh, totally. But I think believing in a value system, which is how can I make an impact of, on the world, knowing that I've had access to some of the best educational opportunities, knowing that I've been privileged enough to work on Wall Street, trusting in that and trusting in serendipity is something mm -hmm. I really believe in as well. Well, it's interesting yeah. because what you said was what we hear from so many women, and you, you really got to mission. Women report to us, um, that the number one reason they accept a job is meaning and purpose. Mm. Uh, the number two and three reasons are how much they can learn who they work with. And money is number four. Wow. Um, doesn't yeah. mean we want to make less money, but it's number four. So did you negotiate your salary 
uh, when you came into your new job or did you accept what they offered you? I think for me, there were a couple of elements that were important, it, especially in the startup world. So it's it's salary, it's it's equity, mm-hmm. it's opportunity to to earn a bonus based on performance. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, benefits, of course. So I did negotiate, um, but I, I do think it's important to have not be afraid to. Oh, you have to. Yeah. If they're giving the money to the folks who negotiate and not to the folks who don't, then you can start off with a pay gap that can be tough to make up through the course of your whole career. That's exactly right. One of the classes I took at Columbia Business School is managerial negotiations. Mm-hmm. What was interesting in that class was a conversation came up on gender differences in negotiating. Mm-hmm. The debate that they presented to us was, so women have certain characteristics that they bring to the negotiating table. Should they try to abandon those and just negotiate as if they were a guy or should they embrace those? What was the answer? We were, it was split pretty evenly, but I think what I would say... That hurts me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. your view women, on it? Oh, yeah. Women change, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I spent my whole friggin' career. Women change. Um, be more risk-taking. Yeah. Be more assertive. Be more like a man. Act like a man. Which I guess sounds okay until you realize there's a backlash for doing that. Plus, for companies... You know, the entire power of diversity, which is so well documented that diverse teams outperform smarter teams and have higher returns on equity and lower risk and greater innovation and greater client engagement and greater employee engagement, all that good stuff that comes from diversity. Well, doesn't that fall away if we all act like a white guy? Um, One of the things we don't talk about very much is that a reason for the financial crisis is that one, there was very little diversity, so there was a bunch of people thinking the same. Yes. And two... Um, for people of difference in the industry, we had been so taught to act like the majority that we didn't bring our difference to work. I can't tell you how many times uh, when I was mid-career on Wall Street and I had female friends who were traders and their badge of honor was they took more risks than the guys did. So they were more male, they were more macho than the macho guys. Um, That's not helping anybody. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Were you sexually harassed? You know, <laughs> I hope you keep that long pause in there. <laughs> I, I I, can't say that I, I um, let's see. Thankfully, I haven't experienced overt sexual harassment. Having said that, were there little microaggressions that took place? For example, when I was early on in my career on the street, you know, all the guys were were going to party with the clients you know, and, and bond with them in that way. And it's, or maybe, you know, I, you know, the guys were going to go on a run during lunch and could you man the desk while I went, while we go for a run together. But I think, I think in some ways those small microaggressions might be um, almost equally as taxing because it's kind of constant and it's all the time. We're not allowed to complain about it either. No, no. You guys are going for, you know, you guys are going to a bar without me. Wow, boohoo! Um, exactly. And, and by the way, I can tell. I know this this conversation is uncomfortable, uh, but I think it's an important one for yeah. us to have. So, yeah, I was totally sexually harassed. Of course, it was the '80s and '90s. Mm. Um, it was overt. It was hostile. The goal of it was to drive the women out um, from the industry. When I was a junior investment banking associate. I was on a client team that was led by a well-known um, CEO of a client company, just sort of one of these, you know, guys who was always in the newspaper. And uh, he was flying in from the West Coast one evening and invited, you know, called me directly. I thought, oh, my goodness, <laughs> and invited me to come over and go over the numbers with him. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I am so good at my job that I am being asked to come go over the numbers with the CEO without the vice president or the director or the managing director or the senior managing director. Look at me, so good at my job. And then he, of course, invited me to go over those numbers with him at 11 o'clock at night in his hotel room. Mm. Now, I I may have been from the South, but I wasn't a naive lady. And I went to the senior banker at the time at the company I was working at. And it was interesting because he took me off the um, deal which at the time I was really grateful for because it took me out of a very difficult situation. However, he put me on another deal that was not nearly the high, high, as high profile 
or as lucrative or as interesting as that deal. And at the time, I just thought, isn't that great that I work for such a forward-looking company? And yet, my bonus was lower that year because I didn't have the revenues associated to my name for something that was completely not my fault. And I think that's what I'm loving, Bianca, about your generation is changing because my generation, we looked away. Mm. I mean, if if a woman sued a company for harassment, everybody stepped back and everybody looked away. And your generation is coming together. So when Susan Fowler went after Uber, went after Travis and Uber, Mm -hmm. women came around her on social media in a way we couldn't have in my generation and took him out. Mm -hmm. I think, and some of this driven by the election of Trump and a recognition that what we what my generation has done wasn't enough is you, y'all are coming together mm-hmm. and banding together yeah. and using your voice in a way that we, one, didn't have the means to because we didn't have social media, but two, you know, frankly, just didn't have the guts, to, you know, did, you know, just didn't do it. As an entrepreneur building your company the exact way you would ever want it to be, how can you institutionalize basically the opposite of gender bias? It, it, do you do you write it out? You know, we have a no app. Policy. We have no, what do you no, do? He, here's what I would say. Um, first of all, I think almost every CEO in the country of big companies believes in the power of diversity today. And our progress on women getting the CEO jobs has stalled because middle management is where diversity goes to die. What I have found as CEO, even when I'm like, hey, we're a company that's going to, you know, advance, you know, close the gender investing gap and we're all about women and we're going to be all about diversity. And I still find that my leadership, you know, members of the team come back and like, I'm going to hire this person like myself. Mm. You know what I do? No, you're not. And my co-founder, you got to be kidding me. We have to let our managers manage. And I'm just like, I don't even care. Right. We, you know, if they don't want to work at a diverse company, they can, we can all go find other places to work. Mm. But I, I will not allow us to talk ourselves into a homogenous company. So I've had an insight back when I was CFO of City. And I, we were down in Latin America visiting clients, doing business reviews. And but there were probably eight guys with me traveling. And uh, we stayed out late one night in Brazil I'm at 1 o'clock in the morning. I had to get up super early the next day to fly to Argentina. Probably had to be down in the lobby at 5 a.m. And we get down there, and the guys are like, I just woke up. I just woke up. I was asleep 10 minutes ago. I'm exhausted. I'm like, I've been up for one hour because of hair and makeup. Mm-hmm. And then I began to think about the toll that takes. And so the math is if hair and makeup takes me 15 extra minutes a day, which is not true, it's way more. Um, I'm high maintenance. But if it's 15 minutes a day, it's an hour and 15 minutes a week, and it's five hours a month, and it's 60 hours a year. So that's one full work week a year for hair and makeup. Haven't even shaved my legs yet. (laughs) Yeah, I think what that shows is as a woman, we inherently have a lot going on, we become incredibly good at multitasking. Things like motherhood should be considered a skill set, a life skill set that's actually enhancing a woman's ability to execute their job. But it's not. Exactly. And this drives me berserk. So I'm going to go back again to when I was CFO, and I remember being on a panel of other CFOs, and they were all male, and I was a female. And I got the inevitable question from a woman in the audience about my work-life balance. And you just sort of felt like, that's fantastic. Um, I've now made CFO of one of the largest companies around, and it's still not good enough. Because in addition to doing this, I have to be, I have to have balance, which of course is absolutely effing impossible when you're doing these big jobs. And rather than recognizing work-life balance for what it is, which is a privilege, a privilege that our sisters who are cleaning the hotel rooms in this city today, do not have. Instead, you know, society has sort of put it upon us that it's a requirement. Recently at Ellevest, we changed our parental leave policy, our family leave policy, so that um, caregivers, primary caregivers, and secondary secondary caregivers get the same parental leave. 
Uh, why? Because the research tells us that if the primary caregiver, in most cases the woman, um, takes a parental leave and the father doesn't, then we get mommy tracked. But if both take them, then it becomes normal. You can't mommy track your whole friggin' company. And so I would put forth with real data and statistics that diversity outperforms meritocracy. Part of it is like, it's just like friggin' do it, mm. right? If you really believe in it, CEO, just friggin' do it and quit with, you know, all these sort of glance, you know, ways to sort of glance off the problem. Just say, we're just, it is just important enough for us to have a diverse company. We're just going to do it. So tell me, why did you become an entrepreneur? You were building um, a very successful, uh, the beginnings of a successful career on Wall Street, and mm -hmm. you made the decision to go the more entrepreneurial, the riskier route. What was behind that? At the um, end of my stint on Wall Street, I was fortunate enough to be exposed to emerging markets. So as part of my work at the Merchant Bank, I focused on building our first investment vehicle, investing in financial services in sub-Saharan Africa. And I was able to travel to the continent and be exposed to economies, some of the fastest growing economies in the world, including Nigeria, Rwanda. And what they, what they were doing was they were consciously involving women in every single facet, whether it was in government, business and in every facet of their society because they recognized that in order to move their country forward they needed to activate their entire population mm -hmm. women reinvest 90 times at the rate that men do they are less likely to default on their mm -hmm. loans they control the majority of purchasing power they make all the financial decisions in their family they're literal mini asset allocators mm -hmm. of their family they, they allocate assets into finance into health into education etc and so if you can put more money in the pocket of women, then you can actually inject more money into the economy mm -hmm. overall because they will spend it. And I said, investing in women is powerful. And I wanted to take those same tactics and focus on the Caribbean and Puerto Rico where my grandparents are from, but also places in the US like the Bronx where I grew up or Detroit or Miami, these high growing cities that are in need of new revitalization tools. I worked on building an entrepreneurship accelerator for women owned businesses in Puerto mm -hmm. Rico as a tool for economic revitalization. Uh, so that was that was Access Latina, the nonprofit accelerator that I started. And again, it was really just this tool that I thought, well, investing in women, if this is working in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, why can't it work yeah. right here in the mainland U.S.? And so that's what drove me. And then ultimately went on to business school to focus on learning about early stage investing. What I would love to understand from you, Sally, is obviously you are building a financial services technology company, a wealth management platform for women. What was your experience as an entrepreneur with, with getting investment into your company in terms of female investors? And, yeah. and how do you think yeah. we can, as women, start to invest in each other more, put our money where our mouth is kind of thing, or take an actionable kind of step into furthering the pie for, for everyone through investment? Money is power. We all know this in a capitalist society. Men have more money than women do. Therefore, men have more power than women do. If you can do one thing to improve society or community, it is to get more money to women. When women ha build wealth, they put 90% of it back into their community and back into their families. When women have more money, they give a higher percentage of their wealth to nonprofits than men do. Um, so I'm spending this part of my career working to close a money gap that I didn't even really recognize existed, which is the gender investing gap. For years, our industry, Wall Street, the investing industry, blamed women for not investing as much as men do they're so risk averse, right? They, they need a financial relationship. They need more financial education. Rather than ever stopping and saying, you know what, maybe we, the investing industry, which is 90 to 95% male, maybe we're just doing a better job for the guys than we are for the women. Maybe we can build something that motivates women to invest. Part of Elevest um, is the option and opportunity to invest in other women. Boy, that seems weird, right? Why is that a good thing to do? I mean, I just want to invest in the best. Right? I just want to invest in the best stocks and the best companies and the best categories. Yes, and today we're all investing in a gender. We're not thinking about it, but we are. We're investing in men. And so all we're wanting to do at Elevest is, if someone is interested in it, move some portion of their portfolio to invest in women, which, as mentioned earlier, Companies with diverse leadership teams tend to outperform less diverse leadership teams. Women pay back their loans to a greater degree than men. Mm -hmm. I can go on and on, but I personally believe that you can earn competitive returns, lower risk, by diversifying just as you do by every other 
you know, by country, by area of the world, by type of investment. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it is not at all about excluding white men. It is about including women and that we just need to keep coming back to the economy can grow, the markets can go up by inc being inclusive and bringing more people in. It's a win, 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 win. Um, and yeah, I got all the stories, right? I went to the male VCs and did the, you know, but don't their husbands manage their money for them? And, you know, why do women need their, I mean, there's just a freaking article yesterday. Why do women need, do women need their own investing platform? And of course, everybody, but, you know, it's like, no, they don't. I'm like, obviously they do. <laughs> if they didn't, why, you know, why are they keeping 71% of their money in cash? You could say, no, they don't all you want, but just look at the facts. And the mm -hmm. facts are, we don't invest as much as men do, so obviously something needs to change. Listening to Sally and Bianca, it's clear that there's an awareness of all the hurdles women face in the workplace, but that awareness isn't enough. Like Sally said, despite all the talk of diversity initiatives and general agreement among business leaders that a diverse workforce leads to better financial outcomes, the numbers for women in the best paying jobs aren't great. And they're actually getting worse. With Indra Nooyi, the CEO of Pepsi, stepping down from her post this year, CEOs of the biggest U.S. companies are now whiter and more male than they've been in a long time, reversing the modest gains made on diversity earlier this century. In recent months, female CEOs have also stepped down from the Campbell Soup Company, Mattel, and Hewlett Packard. This is all despite the fact that more women than men earn college degrees now, and women make up almost 50% of entry-level hires. So why, given everything we know and everything companies claim to be doing, are women still not making it to the highest and highest paid echelons of the business world? Because, like Sally said, middle management is where diversity goes to die. And that has a lot to do with motherhood. Successful women are expected to have work-life balance, while men are allowed to just work. That was true when Sally was coming up, and Bianca will likely face the same double standard as she progresses. That is, unless the workplace adapts. Thanks for listening. If you like our show or if you have anything else to add to the conversation, please head on over to Apple Podcasts to rate, review, and subscribe. This show was edited by Jillian Goodman, produced by Liz Smith, and hosted by me, Rebecca Greenfield. Francesca Levy moderated today's conversation. We also had production help from Janet Paskin and Tover Forges. Francesca Levy is Bloomberg's head of podcasts. We'll be back next week with more conversations.